zor geçmişlerle yüzleşme pratiklerini ışık tutan dünya shedding light on the practices of facing difficult past we are holding a series of panels and this is the fifth my name is Fishne and I'm here today as an author and as an educator at a museum this program will last until 8.30 and I will be moderating aim to open on April 2019 the Grand Tink memory space preparations are underway and concurrently this panel of distinguished speakers shares global experiences of this. All the agencies on the panels are actually places visited by the team and get to know one on one. And the result of this research process today with us we have from Poland, Larissa Michalska from the Polish Museum and from the Berlin Jewish Museum, Sarah Firon. And from Tirana in Albania, the House of Leaves, Secret Surveillance Museum Director, Eklave Moliari. And again from Albania, one of the implementers of the project to transform a prison into a memory space, Miriam Bilaci, is with us as panelists today. Through their presentations, our panelists aim to answer a few questions which I will share with you now. Museums dealing with difficult pasts, how can they contribute to dialogue and understanding? The visitor and education programs implemented at museums and memorial spaces, how can they serve to fight polarization? And in, what are the challenges in implementing the educational activities? Reminding people of difficult paths and creating memory spaces, why are they important? So these are the questions that the panelists will try to answer. And in the final 20 minutes of our program, we will open the floor to questions and answers. And now I leave the floor to our first panelist, Larissa. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here today with you and to share some thoughts about uh, my work and the place where I'm working also. And uh, as you can see on the slide behind me, I will talk about past, present, and the future in the specific place, which is a Jewish museum. I came here from Poland, from Kraków. I work in education department in Galicia Jewish Museum. And uh, before I will start to talk about the challenges, I would like to tell you a few words about uh, the place. Mm -hmm. So Galicia Jewish Museum is located in Kraków in the former Jewish quarter called Kazimierz. And this is a very historical part of the city. We are surrounded by the synagogues. Today is not the Jewish quarter anymore, but there are still some Jewish institutions around. So the Jewish life is still very visible. But how it started, how uh, this dream came true. So since the very beginning, there was an idea. There was a man. His name was Chris Schwartz. He was a British photographer. And he got also Polish Jewish roots. He came to Poland for the first time in 80s. He was taking the photos, he was making the reportages about solidarity movement, Solidarność in Polish, and he was taking the photos also of Lech Walesa. So very important for Polish and Eastern European democracy. But during his stay in Poland, he found something more interesting for him. He found so many traces, traces of Jewish past, traces of Jewish history, traces of Jewish culture, almost everywhere. What was surprising for him was the fact that all of these traces were just a part of the landscape for the local people. These people didn't pay attention at all. So what he planned to do was to keep the memory of all of these places because he thought that in some time this story will be simply forgotten. So in early 90s, he met another person. You can see his photo uh, behind me. It was Professor Jonathan Weber. He came from England. He was a professor at Oxford University. And in 90s, he came to Poland with a series of the lectures at the university. These two men met, and they decided to cooperate. They decided to 
tell the story, the forgotten, almost forgotten stories. They were traveling through southern Poland, and as you can imagine, at the end of 80s, beginning of 90s, we didn't have so many uh, guides, so many books about the Jewish heritage also. So they were traveling using bicycles, they took some students with them, and they were crossing Poland asking people for some stories. They collected their oral history, and based on that, they decided to build the, the museum. For them, it was absolutely obvious that the best place to do it is the former Jewish quarter in Krakow. And this museum was open in 2004. So next year, we will celebrate the 15th anniversary. And unfortunately, only three years after the opening, Chris Schwartz, the founder, died. He is buried also in Krakow because he stayed in that place to take a look on his museum. But we still continue this idea of education, of changing the people's mind, because I have to tell you that we still are fighting with some stereotypes. And many people who are coming to Poland and they think about Jewish history and the Jewish culture, they are focused on the Holocaust and the Second World War. And of course, we don't deny that the Holocaust was one of the most important events in the human history. History. But we cannot talk about the Holocaust without any other knowledge. We have to know there was something before. And we also have to be aware there is something after the Holocaust. Because the Holocaust, it wasn't the end of the Jewish history in Poland. And, you know, I'm not the best in math, but I would like to provide you some numbers, some statistics, so you can realize about which place I'm talking about. So we are one museum, but... Uh, this is the statistics from last year, 2017. So we hosted more than 5,500 people. We have such a big group of the visitors, and this number is still growing. We organized so many lectures, workshops. We had eight traveling exhibitions. We opened seven temporary exhibitions at the museum. We also organized a Crocus project. I would like to tell you something more about it later. So it's growing institution. We are more or less 20 people working there. Some of us are part-time working, but uh, majority are full-time employees. And uh, this institution is growing, is developing, and we cooperate with many Jewish organizations, not only from Krakow. So uh, let's continue with the statistics. So you can see how the number of the visitors is growing. And um, majority are the groups. Then we have individuals, but we also organize some open events, open for everyone who would like to enjoy. Some of them are for free, some are paid. It depends of the, of the situation. And it's quite interesting to see from which countries we host the visitors. So the majority are from Great Britain. It's probably connected also with the person of the founder of our museum. He was British, so he transferred this idea to Great Britain. But we also host people from many, many different countries. But uh, what is interesting, so uh, you can see here the number of the nationalities of the group visitors. It's Great Britain is also on the first position. It's because in Great Britain there is a special program at school for the children about the Holocaust, about the Second World War. So they are coming to Poland, they have the full package. There is also a visit in Auschwitz-Birkenau, they are visiting our museum, and they have some activities also on that spot. And uh, you can see the number of the guided tours we are giving at the museum is also growing year by year. So uh, we still... We, every year we bet the record. And uh, what we have so special at this museum, so the central part of our museum is the main exhibition, the core exhibition, which is called Traces of Memory. If you remember from the beginning of this presentation, these two names, Chris Schwartz and Jonathan Weber, they created the exhibition. That was the heart of the museum. And around this exhibition, we kind of de developed some educational projects. So you can see how it looks today, because two years ago we changed the system and the visual system on the exhibition. So we divided the space into five sections. And uh, what is really important for us is to keep the balance, because we don't want to be focused only on the Holocaust. So we have five different sections, and only one of them is devoted to the Holocaust and the wartime. And, um, 
The name of the museum is Galicia Jewish Museum. Uh, when we talked to each other recently, uh, there was a question, why Galicia? Because people always connect Galicia with Spain, because it is a region in Spain. But here you can see on this map the former Galicia, so it's this territory. And today part of it, where you have the cities marked, is a Poland and the second part is in Ukraine because in 18th century uh, there were partitions, three partitions in the Polish history and after the third one Poland disappeared from the map, lost the independence for 123 years and after the first partition in 1772 uh, that partition was between Prussia, Russia and Austria. The Austrians created a new province and get, they gave the name Galicia to this province and uh, this is like the Latin version of the names of two cities, it was Halic uh, and Włodzimierz, so it's called like Galicia and Lodomeria. So we are talking, we are focused on our museum, on the Polish part of Galicia. So I would like just short describe you what we have in each section of this exhibition. So the first section is devoted to the thing we can see around us, the Jewish life in ruins. Because even today, so many years after the end of the Second World War, you still can find so many different ruins in different places, in a big cities, small towns, even in teeny tiny villages. So on this picture, you can see the interior of one of the synagogues. Today, we can say that nature took what belongs to the nature, actually. It's like the garden inside of the synagogue. So this section is devoted to this bad condition of the Jewish heritage you can see in many different places in Poland. But uh, as I said, we always try to keep the balance at the museum and on this exhibition as well. So there is also a second section. And in the second section, you can see the beauty and the richness of the Jewish culture and the Jewish heritage in Poland today. Because we have a lot of preserved places, renovated places, places where are people who are taking care, people who are devoted to the Jewish culture and the Jewish history, even if these people are not Jewish, or I would say majority of these people are not Jewish. So we have these two sections at the beginning to understand the difficulties and the um, complexity of the Jewish history in Poland. And we are talking about the 10 centuries of Jewish non-Jewish coexistence in this country. But then we are going further and we are getting to know the difficult, the most difficult history, so the wartime history. And the third section is devoted to the Holocaust. But what is extremely important for us is to pay the attention of the visitors that the Holocaust is not only the Auschwitz-Birkenau. And uh, we underline always that there are many places of mass massacres, mass executions, in the forests, on the fields, on the meadows. Uh, there were executions in the ghettos, on the streets, in the cities, everywhere. So this wartime history is visible in many places. It, it doesn't have to be only the camp, the former camp. So you can see so many photos like this, showing the mass graves somewhere in between of the forest, there was nothing around. But these places are kind of silenced, but they kept the memory of this horrible part of the history. But we are going further because there is one goal for all of us, is the memory and remembrance. And we have to keep the memory of all of these people who didn't survive. And also we have to remember about survivors. And uh, we are showing that also in the fourth section. It has a title, How the Past is Being Remembered, but when I'm guiding through this exhibition, I always add to this title another sentence, or how is not, because we are showing some examples how people remember today about the Jewish history, about the Jewish past, about the Jewish communities, but also we are presenting some examples how people try to forget, or how they try to close their eyes, how do they try to avoid some topics, because it's still uncomfortable even if it's so many years after the Second World War. But then there is a last section of this exhibition, completely different one. This is the only one section where you can see people on the photos. And uh, the title is The Revival of the Jewish Life because that's the phenomenon we have in Poland today. We can see the revival of Jewish life, revival of the Jewish culture. and. Uh, as I said, I'm not good in math, but one more statistic now, uh, because this is the most frequent question uh, we are asked. How many Jews live in Poland today? 
It's extremely difficult to answer to this question because we simply don't know that. We don't have such a statistics. But according to the last national survey, 8,000 people identify themselves as a Jews. This number is probably bigger, but this is the only one official number we have. So I can tell you that uh, I'm pretty sure that today we have many more events connected with the Jewish culture than 8,000, because there are so many people, non-Jewish people, who are really interested in a Jewish history, in a Jewish culture, and without their help, it wouldn't be possible to see this revival. And uh, we have to keep in mind the difficult history of Poland, because after the, the liberation, after the end of the Second World War, Poland wasn't a free democratic country. There was communism regime. So to talk about Jews, it was forbidden for such a long time. So today, people are discovering this forgotten, hidden past. So we can see this revival, this great idea, great, we can say, social movement also. And uh, as I said, Chris Schwartz passed away only three years after the opening of this museum. So you can imagine how many things changed in Poland between 2007 and today. So we needed to add some new photos, we needed to replace some photos, because what is important for us is to be fair with our visitors. We want to show them the truth, the real life, the reality. So we asked for help another photographer. His name is Jason Francisco. He's from United States, but he's kind of connected with this region also. And um, he took some new photos for us. So you can see here the new version of the exhibition. And the photographer is the man in the hat in the glasses. This is Jason Francisco. Francisco. And this photo was taken actually on the opening of this new exhibition. So we have the, the guided tours there. We are guiding different groups, teachers, students, uh, completely different age groups also. So this is the main exhibition, the heart of the museum. But as I said, we organize also, we show temporary exhibitions. And there are completely different topics of these exhibitions. So I choose some of them we presented last year. And um, we had the great exhibition in cooperation with some Hungarian organizations about the Hungarian Lions of the Judah. So the Hungarian Jews, Jews which were fighting in Austro-Hungarian army. Uh, we had so many artifacts, original artifacts, which enriched this exhibition. There were some uh, graphics exhibition. And one of the Chris Schwartz exhibitions, because he was not only devoted to the Jewish topics, but also he was so focused on the social problems, like poverty, homelessness, migrations, uh, problems uh, in the eastern part of the world, let's say. So we showed this, um, this exhibition with a very meaningful title, There is a, Such a Thing as Society, showing some social problems uh, in 70s, 80s, uh, especially in England, there was this focus. But one of the, our newest child uh, was the exhibition, the girl in the diary, searching for Rivka from the witch ghetto. There was a beautiful story connected with this exhibition. There is a huge project, and we still, uh, this is an ongoing project, actually. That was the first time when the, the exhibition on this topic was uh, established, and we were the first place which showed this exhibition. There was a diary of girl, Jewish girl written in a woods ghetto in Poland, but this diary was found in Auschwitz-Birkenau, next to one of the crematoriums. The Soviet doctor who came with the army, with the Soviet army to Auschwitz to liberate the camp, found this diary that was a one notebook. And of course, she didn't speak Polish. She had no idea what is it. So, but she thought it's something important. So he, she took this diary with her to her home in Siberia, so quite far from Auschwitz-Birkenau and far from wood. And uh, many years later, her grandmother discovered this diary in the family archive. And she decided to learn something more about the author. She wanted to know what is it actually, because they thought it was written in Auschwitz. She took this diary to United States, and then the whole story started, because finally someone was able to read it, to translate it, and it was clear that this diary was written in a witch ghetto. It was written by a teenager. This girl was 13, 14 years old when she was writing. And what is interesting and extraordinary is the fact that this girl was Orthodox Jew. We don't have so many testimonies 
like diaries written by Orthodox Jews, and this girl was writing not in Yiddish, but in Polish. This is the second interesting element. She was writing a lot about the religious life, about the customs, about her faith. So this is something would makes this diary extraordinary. Now we lead some uh, workshops. We had we organized two seminars for the teachers about this story. There is also a website. Now it's just a Polish version. The English version is under construction. But uh, I really encourage you to check this website soon. In like two weeks, should be ready in English. There are some um, scenarios for the workshops and lessons for children. There's a whole story of this diary of this girl and this whole whole project because something really worth to, to talk about. We also made a moving mobile exhibition. So you can also rent it. You can also have it here in Istanbul. It's possible to get it. And uh, I would like to tell you what specific we are doing in education department because there are a lot of different activities. So first, we of course have some lectures, workshop, museum lessons. It's like the basis. Uh, we organize also the city games. So we try to encourage, the, especially the young people, to learn something more about Jews in the city, in the space. You can, they can see the synagogues. They can see the Jewish cemetery. Everything like in reality. They don't have to imagine that. And what is really important, one of the most important a uh, part of our program are the meetings with survivors, the Holocaust survivors, former prisoners of the camps, especially Auschwitz-Birkenau, and the righteous Gentiles. We organize also some projects, remembrance projects. We prepare education materials. There are so many different activities. So I would like to show you some photos uh, showing this diversity, what is our keyword, actually. We organize the workshops for the children, and you might ask yourself why we have kind of Chinese workshop in a Jewish museum. That was a project during the Jewish Culture Festival, and uh, we decided to take the children for a virtual trip around the world to show them the different places where Jews are living. Uh, the, the places they maybe didn't connect with the Jewish culture and the Jewish community. So there was a trip to China, to India, to South Africa also. So we were showing them the diversity of Jewish life also today. So we organized also some artistic workshop for the youngest children. So this is a good way to learn something more about the different cultures. But for the older children, the school pupils, we organized the workshop about the Jewish culture, about the Holocaust also, about um, the history. There are some lectures, short lectures for them. So they are preparing some works afterwards. So it's very good to see the result later, because if we start without zero knowledge about Jews very often. After the workshop, something is changing in their mind, and they, they are asking many questions also, because one and a half hour, this is the time for the workshop, very often is not enough, because they would like to get something more. And we also organize the, the lectures. We invite people from the outside, some specialists, some professors. We also organize some workshops, but ourselves. and. Uh, the topics are completely different. They are uh, very diverse topics, always kind of related to the Jewish culture, but not necessarily. Uh, we organize also many meetings, the book promotions, for example, meetings with the specialists, panel discussions like here we are today. Um, there are some conferences, little conferences. This is the, the opening of the, the new exhibition, so you can see also the co-authors of that. And as I said, one of the most important elements, the meetings with the survivors, righteousness, and witnesses of the history. On the photos you can see, uh, on the top photo you can see Ms. Lydia Maximovic, she's in the Holocaust. Uh, she's an Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, survivor. She's not Jewish. She came from Belarus originally, but she lives in Poland. After the war, she stayed in Poland. She was adopted by Polish family, and she feels Polish as well. Like Polish patriot, she always underlined. And she really likes to meet with the groups to, to share her story. Uh, she was one of the children used as a guinea pigs during the Dr. Mengele experiments. So she has a very powerful, very meaningful story to share. Uh, below there is uh, Miss Monica Goldwasser, so the Holocaust survivor, and she was also adopted by the Polish family. And I would like to show you the statistics also. So you can see that the number of these meetings is growing year by year. And 
last year we organized almost 400 meetings and we have to remember that um, the number of people, the group of the survivors is smaller and smaller every year. So this is one of our problems, one of the challenges, what to do when these people will be not with us anymore. So what to do in some years, how to replace, how to um, share these stories with the young people without the witnesses, because these stories shared by these people has a huge, have a huge impact in the young people. Uh, of course, we can try to fix it, we can try to change something in the program, but definitely these kind of meetings are the most meaningful and the most important. So you can see uh, the groups which are surrounding the survivors. And uh, from my experience, I can tell you because uh, I always guide the group and I also translate the meetings if it's for the English speaking group. Uh, so sometimes during the guided tour, the children are losing their interest. You know, they are bored, they are not interested, they are tired. But something is changing during the meeting because after a few minutes, they are really, um, really focused and it's visible that it's something really important for them. After the meeting, they would like to come to shake their hand, uh, to hug the survivor, they ask some additional questions, and it's visible that it's very, very meaningful and moving for them, and something is changing, and uh, especially if this group is going or already visited the camp. So this is like the additional element, this full story. So. Um, this is Ms. Mirosława Gruszczyńska, the righteous Gentile. She and her family uh, sheltered one Jewish girl during the Second World War. And these ladies are still in touch. As though they are calling each other, they still remember about each other. So it's really meaningful also that the war, it wasn't the end of the common story. And we organize also at the museum, we host the ceremony uh, for the righteous Gentiles. So when the people are awarded with this title, and uh, Miss Monica Goldwasser, I mentioned before, uh, she has kind of double story because she's a Holocaust survivor, but she was rescued by the Polish family. And she applied in Yad Vashem to award this family with the title Righteous Among the Nations. And she was successful and the ceremony took place in our museum. She received this diploma on behalf of her parents, Polish parents, as she said. And uh, the ceremony was very, moving for her and there was also the Israeli ambassador in Poland so that was very very official and um, she's always happy to underline that during the meetings that she has kind of double story. So we also have some programs for the teachers especially because it's really important for us to transfer the knowledge because we cannot educate all of the children but we can educate some teachers so they can pass this knowledge to the younger generation to the bigger number of the children. Uh, one of the most important programs for the teachers is a seminar, summer seminar, which is called the Teaching the Holocaust in Context. Because we try to show the different aspects, different stories around the topic of the Holocaust. We try to give the teachers also some tools and to educate them how to teach about such a difficult topic. And uh, we are taking them for some tours also. So we are showing them the places. This is one of the synagogues. This is in Oświęcim, so in the city where is Auschwitz-Birkenau camp. So uh, there are two levels. It's basic and advanced. So um, we are in touch always with these teachers also, and we cooperate in different projects. And one other project is the Crocus project. And I'm so happy to coordinate this project. Maybe some of you heard about it. It was established by the uh, Irish organization. And uh, it's to commemorate one and a half million children murdered during the Holocaust. One crocus bulb is like one life. And uh, children are planting these crocuses. And in the spring, the crocuses are blooming. And the result is like this uh, blooming there's green grass and there's yellow crocuses around. And it's very symbolic also. And it's a good way to teach the, especially younger children, younger pupils, about uh, the Holocaust. It's not traumatizing also. It's uh, very meaningful for them and something special. We got also the reports of the teachers because they organize also some additional workshops, lessons for them. So it's not just planting, but there is something around this planting and the growing uh, of the crocuses is just like the symbolic thing. 
we organized also international uh, activities. One of them was the True Poland program. It was for Israeli a Polish group, later we extend that also for people from diaspora, and it's for the educators, city guides to, that was a trip through Poland, and these people can learn something more about different um, histories in Poland, Polish Jewish history, Jewish non-Jewish history in Poland. So we have uh, different groups for that. Another project uh, what, which I was also coordinating, that was Galicia Silesia. There are two regions in Poland, uh, which are neighboring regions, but with completely different history. And we wanted to connect the Jewish communities from these two regions, because this program was devoted, uh, was created for the Jewish communities from three cities. So they had a meeting, they had a chance to talk, to exchange some ideas, to talk also about the problems. Some of the people knew each other before, they were good friends. Some people just get to know each other during this program. And that was really also important for us to see this interaction, to see how it worked. So this is one of the, this is a visit in Katowice and uh, the group from Krakow came to visit this Jewish community. We organized also a lot of concert performances. We uh, published also some books, booklets. Um, not all of them are connected uh, strictly with the Jewish uh, culture, like the concert and performances. We give the space also for some artistic activities for, for the people from the outside, not necessarily connected with the, with the museum. And at the end, something really important for me personally, because I also um, coordinate the internship program at our museum. And I have to tell you that I'm extremely proud of our interns because we have interns from all around the world. At this moment, when I'm here, we, ha we host one intern from here, from Istanbul also. Mm -hmm. So that was a short exchange. And uh, so uh, we host people from different countries. At this moment, we have uh, interns from uh, Turkey, from Greece, from Austria, from Germany, from Switzerland, and from United States. So. There was a time, uh, I think that was two years ago, when in this one group of interns we have people from different cultures and different faiths. We had Orthodox Jew, we had Muslim, Buddhist and Christians. All of them were in the same group, they were cooperating, they were really happy to work together, exchange the ideas. So. Uh, you can see how some of them look like. They are working in our museum, uh, especially in education department, so my department, but uh, they are also sometimes asked to help uh, the other employees. They have uh, different tasks. They, for example, also lead the workshops. And I'm taking them for some trips there. They visited the synagogues in the, in the area. They are guiding the groups also. Here is a huge group from the March of the Living, which takes place in depends, April of, uh, or May. And uh, I'm taking always these groups for the so-called Shtetl tours. Shtetl is a little town, a specifically Jewish town from the past, of course. And it's to show them the places in their reality, let's say, the real places. Because they are guiding through our exhibition, so they are talking about these places. But it's important to show them the places, how they are looking like, actually. They have a chance to meet some people. They have the chance to learn something in this specific place. We also organize the Mitzvah Day. It's like international activity, and um, it was successful last year. It was successful this year. Last year, we were cleaning the local Jewish cemetery. This year, we are collecting the special like food and uh, some stuff for the animal shelter in the area. And we organize also the workshop about animals in the Jewish history, in the Jewish culture, and in Israel. So that was open for everyone. And the, the visitors enjoyed that, but also what is important for me, that the interns enjoyed that. This is also the last year Hanukkah celebration we had together. And that was open for the audience. We host almost 50 people. So that was a great, huge event organized just for the, by the interns. And, uh, the last slide I would like to show is the last trip. So you can see that we are visiting different places. They have a chance to learn something, not only in the museum, but also outside. What is helpful for them to understand the specific place and the challenges we have. So not only the problem with the survivors who are 
passing away, but also the raising anti-Semitism, uh, raising nationalistic movements, the uh, racism also. So all of these activities is to help them, they, we try to help them to understand this difficult situation and to, to kind of fight with the stereotypes we have. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, if you have any questions afterwards, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Larissa. Teşekkürler. When our next speaker, while our next speaker is getting ready, uh, I can uh, convey a few notes from the presentation of Larissa. She touched upon two very important points. The first one is that by linking past with today, uh, we can touch uh, everyone and it helps us to develop this sense of empathy in the society. This is what we, we can observe from the programs she mentioned. And on the other side, transferring knowledge to the new generation is very important. We cannot reach all children one by one, so training teachers is very important. We saw how valuable it can be to train teachers in this way. Now. Uh, from uh, Berlin Jewish Museum, Sarah Hyren is going to make a presentation. Um, i akşamlar davet it, davetiniz için teşekkür ederim. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's an honor for me to be here at the Hyren Ding Foundation. I have been interested in your country for a very long time. I traveled ten times to your country. I'm still trying to, to learn Turkish. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm still trying to observe and understand how your country is changing over the years. So thank you very much for this invitation, Nayat, and to have the opportunity to be here and to share our experience at the Jewish Museum with you. So I started to work at the Jewish Museum in 2000, just one year before the opening, and I was a research <coughs> assistant. Then I worked at the education department, and now I'm the head of the education uh, outreach so that's a strategy to include new audiences in the museum and to bring non visitors into the museum. So I want to apologize that I have to read my presentation, but I won't feel comfortable enough to talk freely in English the whole time. To better understand how we work, I will give you now some general information about the Jewish Museum in Berlin and its role. It is one of the biggest Jewish museums in Europe and a lively place of reflection on current and historical Jewish life as well as on migration and diversity in Germany. The Jewish Museum is a national historical government financed museum telling the history of Jews in Germany and German Jews from the early Middle Ages till today. It is not a museum run by the Jewish community. We are not a Holocaust museum, but we are part of the wide memorial landscape in Germany, with a lot of other places like historical sites of concentration camps. Here in Berlin, for example, is the memorial to the murdered Jews in Europe. You can see it on the left upper corner. It is the main national memorial in the center of the capital to commemorate the Jewish victims of the mass murder under Nazi Germany. Here on the right side is the topography of the terror a memorial in Berlin where the focus is on the perpetrators and murderers. This was the place where the deportation and extermination of the European Jews were organized. In this Berlin memorial landscape, the Jewish Museum also has its role. You can see a picture of the museum below. The Jewish Museum shows the Jewish perspective on persecution and extermination and tells the story of the Jews in Germany before and after that time. Here, you can see the whole ensemble of the Jewish Museum Berlin. It consists of three buildings. All buildings are designed on different levels by the US American architect Daniel Liebeskind. On the left side, you can see the famous Liebeskind building between the lines, which opened in 2001 and contains the permanent exhibition. Next to it, with a red roof, is the old Barak Palace. Here was the former Museum of the History of Berlin which housed the Jewish department till the fall of the wall. Now, it's the main entrance to the Jewish Museum, 
Our temporary exhibition are shown in this building. And on the opposite side of the street, you can see the Michael Blumenthal Academy. It is named after the former director of the Jewish Museum. It opened in 2012 and houses the academy, the archive, the education department, the library, and some of our offices. Right now, we are in a period of transition, reconfiguring completely our permanent exhibition, which means the concept, the design, and the way how we show the architecture. We closed large parts of the exhibition one year ago, but the architectural highlights, like the basement of the Liebeskind building, stay open. Temporarily, the Jewish Museum shows a huge exhibition about Jerusalem and a smaller exhibition about different aspects of Jewish life in Germany today. I would also like to say some words about the museum's visitors. Since 2001, more than 12 million visitors have come to the Jewish Museum. Around 700,000 people visit our museum every year. 75% of our visitors are international visitors, mostly tourists. The other 25% are local visitors from Berlin or from other parts of Germany. For them, the museum is considered as a highlight during their Berlin journey. Most of our visitors have a higher education and are under 30 years of age. In general, they have very little knowledge on German Jewish history. Each year, Around 65% of our group visitors are school groups from Berlin and all over Germany. We offer more than 6,000 educational programs each year for about 100,000 participants. In Germany, the Nazi period and the Holocaust are an obligatory part of the curriculum in schools, and young people learn a lot about it. But by contrast, they know almost nothing about Jewish history, Jewish culture and religion, or the present day life of Jews in Germany. Jews are mostly considered as victims of the Nazi period. To change, this is a starting point of our mission at the Jewish Museum Berlin. I told you at the beginning of my presentation that the Jewish Museum is currently in a transitional period. We are now in the process of developing a new mission statement that focuses more on the concerns and challenges of post-migrant society and the museum's role in this process. What is our mission so far? The Jewish Museum is an active participant in social discourse. It's a place for exhibition and research as well as a national and international meeting center. Our mission is to focus on the history and culture of the Jews in and originating from German-speaking lands. The Jewish Museum makes the two millennia of German Jewish experience relevant for the present and future population of Germany. It emphasizes the benefits of harmonious interaction between various ethnical, cultural, religious or linguistic groups and calls attention to the high cost of intolerance for everybody. What does life, not just death, mean? The Jewish Museum is not a Holocaust memorial. Instead, we present a view of German Jewish history that is balanced between the celebration of ordinary and extraordinary lives of all generations and the recognition and explanation of the dark side of that history. And finally, the Jewish Museum is focused on and driven by the needs of the visitors. We want to communicate directly and clearly with all visitors. All sections of the museum have a role in providing an excellent experience for their visitors. To recount the genesis of the Jewish Museum Berlin would require an extra presentation. It can only be understood in the social context of dealing with the past. But nevertheless, here I want to present just a few crucial facts about the history of the collection of the Jewish Museum Berlin. Due to the destruction of all Jewish life, during the Nazi period, there was no continuity of inventories of the Jewish museums in Berlin or Frankfurt from the pre-1933 period. Almost everything was destroyed. The leftover objects like Judaica Jewish art were distributed after 1945 to various museums and institutions, principally in Israel and in the United States. Before the Holocaust, around 500,000 German Jews lived in Germany. The few members of the Jewish community in Germany after the Holocaust were mostly survivors from Poland and were not related to Germany. 
The expression building out of nothing summarizes the emergence of most Jewish museums in Germany that were open since the 1980s. The idea for a Jewish museum in Berlin arose in 1971. Through the Society for a Jewish Museum, founded in 1975, objects for the collection could be donated. Especially important for this were the nearly 278,000 Jewish immigrants who were able to flee from Nazi Germany. After worldwide calls in newspapers, Jews donated objects and documents for the collection of the Jewish Museum. Finally, the Jewish Museum for the History of the Jews in Germany opened in 2001, and today our collections encompass about 9,500 works of art, 1,500 objects of religious use, 4,500 objects of material culture, 24,000 photographs, and more than 1,100 individual collections in the archive. Our collections have been randomly acquired and remain fragmented. Up. Now, I would like to shed light on our practice of enabling the active engagement of our visitors and also how we foster dialogue and empathy through our programs. Here, you can see the architecture of Daniel Liebeskind. The basement is an accessible spatial sculpture for visitors to walk around that refers to the time of the persecution of the Jews and the destruction. You can't visit the permanent exhibition without going through this part of the building. The architecture of Liebeskind has a strong visual effect on the visitors, the oblique walls and floors, there are no straight angles, the system of the three axes disorient the visitor. All this triggers a change in physical awareness. It is easy for us, through the effects of the architecture, to enter into an intensive dialogue and exchange with our visitors about how to interpret the architecture, to exchange views and opinions about the Nazi area and how it affected the Jews at that time and what it means today for the visitors. In our guided tours and workshops, we focus on three main topics. The first topic is about history, from the Jews during the Middle Ages to the present days. It includes the time of emancipation, when Jews became Germans and took part as active members of society, as well as the time of persecution and mass murder till to the new beginning of the Jewish community after the Holocaust. The whole historical content of the exhibition gives us many connecting factors and links to have a dialogue with our visitors about exclusion, inclusion, about affiliation, and also about the mutual influence from the majority and minorities. The visitor is not regarded as a passive recipient of lessons about the past, but rather as a partner in a dialogue about the past. The second topic is about Judaism and other religions. We examine the changes in Jewish tradition and religion we show the diversity in Judaism as well as interreligious aspects of the three monotheistic religions. The third topic is about diversity. Here we use mostly methods of theater and acting. This approach is helpful to change perspectives and to work on questions of identities. So, our educational work is based on five methodological aspects. Dialogue and exchange. Means that we encourage dialogue and exchange through our topics and by different ways of communication. We try to find appropriate questions to encourage our visitors to talk with us. We also try to relate the Jewish experience and perspective to their perception and to find how they can relate it to themselves. We also initiate dialogue between different generations, religions, and social groups. Questioning and reflection means for us to look at topics from different perspectives and encourage critical thinking. The role of the educator is very important here. She or he guides and supervises the group discussion so that they were, have the best chance to increase their knowledge. Comparison and differentiation means to work out, for example, the similarities 
and differences of the three monotheistic religions. Where appropriate, we can make contemporary references, discuss them, and here it is particularly important to differentiate precisely. A narrative, an artifact-related approach, means that we tell stories based on biographies and objects. And finally, anti-discrimination means that we place a high value on an open culture of conversation. We use understandable <laughs> language that is sensitive to discrimination. We have a conscious and critical view of power relations and dominance. The resulting inequalities, the effects, consequences and barriers are named and we try to reinforce action against discrimination. By using this methodological approaches, educational work stands for an open, democratic and diverse society. I also want to emphasize the educational program that we offer in cooperation with the museum's archive. It combines working with original documents and encounters with people who grew up as children in Nazi Germany and mostly emigrated to different countries shortly before the war and deportation began. Some of these contemporary witnesses donated historical documents, photographs or even objects to the Jewish Museum. Working in small groups, the students research and reconstruct the life and destiny of the main person or even a family with the help of photos, letters, children drawings, emigration papers and other sources. Staff members from the archive and the educational department supervise the students' work with the historical sources supporting them in reading and analyzing. Then the students present their results to each other in presence of the invited contemporary witness. Questions can be asked and answered on both sides. In this way, all participants in the encounter are enriched. In my opinion, this is one of the educational programs of the museum that can foster dialogue and empathy in a very intense way. On tour, the Jewish Museum Berlin tours schools as a traveling educational program that has visited secondary schools and other institutions across Germany since 2007. On tour reach kids and teens who would otherwise not have a chance to visit the Jewish Museum in Berlin. In the last 10 years we worked with around 600 schools all over Germany and reached more than 70,000 students. In the center of on tour is a mobile exhibition that offers students the opportunity to learn about Jewish tradition and culture, Jewish history and presence, about pluralism and diversity in Judaism in an independent, interactive way. The five cubes of the exhibition shows a variety of everyday objects, many of which are connected to the young people's world. There are many objects that they can touch with their hands and pick up. The students can sit on, rotate and turn over the cubes. They are strongly encouraged to explore the exhibition. Then the students give presentations about what they have learned through the peer-to-peer -peer approach. Educators of the on tour team support them in the process of providing interesting facts about the objects, asking and answering questions and moderating the presentation. On tour also offer workshops using tablets. One workshop is based on the themes of identity and ancestry, faith and home. Six Jewish teenagers living in Germany introduce themselves in interactive photo albums. The students are invited to connect to this presentation and ask also questions about their own identity. How am I shaped by my family history? What do I believe in? What are other people's beliefs? Where do I belong? I would also like to tell you something more about our latest project. In September this year, we launched a new website, Jewish Places. It is a collaborative, interactive map application that visualizes current and historical places of Jewish life in Germany. We cooperate with already existing online platforms on Jewish history and present. With Jewish Places, we linked up with these websites and increased their visibility. But Jewish Places is also open to everyone who is interested in working with us. Via an easy to use interface, they can upload or input text, images or videos of synagogues, 
associations and many other Jewish institutions. All collaborators are pursuing the common goal of illustrating the complexity and diversity of Jewish life in Germany in the past and in the present. Jewish Places is designed to fit the needs of local institutions and be used by regional projects and their educational activities. We feel that collaborating with users is a logical consequence of open access and a great opportunity for science in general. Finally, I want to concentrate on the academy programs. The Jewish Museum expanded its, its activities in 2013 to address questions of migration and diversity as well as Jewish-Islamic relations. Though Germany is home to immigrants, you should know that it has only recently begun to view itself as a country of immigration. Today, Jews are without around 200,000 persons, a very small minority in Germany, but uh, with a very strong symbolic impact because of the past. If Jews decide to live and to stay in Germany, in a way, it is seen as a guarantor that Germany is a democratic and liberal country. A much larger minority are the four million Muslims in Germany. Therefore, the Jewish Museum and the Academy both explore the relationships between minority groups and the majority population. The Academy programs consist of two pillars, the program on migration and diversity and the Jewish Islamic Forum. The, pro the program on migration and diversity includes lectures, conferences, workshops and panel discussion to discuss highly relevant social political themes. It creates space for new perspectives on other religious and ethnic minorities. It promotes exchange and network building among minorities. Another priority is to understand the history of migration to Germany and to ingrain migration history into the public's historical consciousness. The Jewish Islamic Forum concentrates on the situation of Jews and Muslims as minorities in Germany and the history of their fluctuating relationship. It pursues questions of philosophy and religious practice, such as the tension between tradition and modernity in both religions. In particular, the forum aims to counteract the strictly, strictly divided perception of Judaism and Islam. It reveals their commonalities without neglecting the unique attributes of each. The Jewish Islamic Forum proposes lecture series focusing on one main topic with the two experts explaining Jewish or the Islamic way of understanding it. Currently, the lectures are about science and faith in Judaism and Islam. The one before was about Jewish and Islamic perspectives on human rights. To make it available to a larger audience, all lectures can also be viewed afterwards on the GMB YouTube channel. To conclude, I would like to say that we consider the Jewish Museum not only as a place where knowledge about Jewish history and tradition is presented, but also as a communication zone where we have an intense dialogue and exchange with our visitors about topics of the past and the present which are relevant for society in Germany today. With our different projects and methods, we want to encourage a change of perspectives and empathy. The approach is not to evoke, st evoke strong emotions, but to enhance different and critical thinking on supposedly known subjects and new topics. Moreover, the general population in Germany continues to be transformed. It will be increasingly determined by people whose family history shares no direct connection with the Holocaust. The contrast between perpetrators and victims which determines the identities and the perspective of two post-war generations will disappear more and more and is being transformed into new configurations. Therefore, the Jewish Museum is in the middle of a process of driven by social change by trying to include more and more people with different cultural, educational and social backgrounds as staff and as visitors. The museum's visitors are still not representing the general population in Germany. For that, we still have a lot of work ahead of us to attract people who have previously not visited the museum. We must also reflect and change our attitude so that the Jewish Museum welcomes everybody. Our goal is to be a museum for everyone. Thank you for your attention.
in modern museums, it's not just about presenting the topic, but you also need to give consideration to the needs of the audience, which is really valuable work. And as far as we've seen here, the role of museum education in creating a democratic society, which is something that's been quite actively done. So thank you once again for that. Good evening. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank uh, Randing Foundation and NIAD for inviting me here. I'm very glad to be here in Istanbul and in Handing uh, Foundation. And for, I want to thank you also for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, present the newest, uh, here? No. the newest uh, museum in, uh, in uh, uh, Albania the National Museum of Secret Surveillance House of Leaves. But uh, uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, to put you in the context of, uh, of Albania in dealing with the, the past, because the challenge of the past, its legacy and burden, was in the inevitable starting point for the new democracies of uh, communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe. The trauma of the victims and uh, uh, the responsibility of the perpetrators and beneficiaries of the former regimes were and are the basis of the relationships of the interactions that take place in our societies. For societies emerging from prolonged dictatorship like Albania, there is generally a need to ask what happened, who is responsible for the past, should this responsibility be attributed to certain individuals, groups, regimes or society. All these issues have been of particular uh, importance recently. In this context, the concept of transitional justice was born, and uh, uh, which has already taken on a global uh, importance. Conventionally, uh, transitional justice, a term which is used for the first time at the end of the 20th century, includes a number of mechanisms such as truth commissions, courts, illustration, reparation, and even recent memorial works, including memorial museums in order to deal with the past injustices. Albania, in uh, dealing with uh, its communist past, on 25th of January 2006, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted a resolution condemning communism crimes by considering them as equivalent to the crimes of Nazism. Albania, who has experienced one of the harshest communist dictatorships in Eastern Europe, voted for this resolution but uh, had a slow start to create a broader framework to engage in facing the communist past. The delay in adopting the law on the opening of dictatorship files and their exploitation as blackmail from politics, the continuing failure of parliament in the law on illustration are facts that burden Albanian politics and society. There have been no public forms of closure, no trials, no imprisonment of the torturers, no truth commissions. This has generated a deeply politicized climate, but not definite results in terms of transitional justice. Today, there are two disturbing tendencies in dealing with the recent past in Albania. First, a decline in knowledge about communist dictatorship, and uh, because of that, underestimation and its glorification. In uh, this picture, uh, there are uh, two persons. Uh, the, uh, on the right is uh, Plum Jufi, which is a historian. And um, uh, on the left is uh, Agron Tufa, who is uh, a director of the Institute for the Crimes uh, and the Consequences of uh, uh, Communism. And there has been a debate uh, in a show TV about uh, the internment camp of Tepelena. Uh, so, um, uh, the director of the Institute for the Crimes of Communism, he, uh, he made a comparison of the internment camp of Tepelena, uh, where, where the prisoners, political prisoners, uh, the families of pri political prisoners went. Uh, he compared it with the Auschwitz camp. And uh, the historian, he, um, 
uh, he supported that uh, it's a comparison that couldn't be done, and so uh, and he t he said also that uh, the, in the internment camp there weren't the number of the children who died there. It uh, it was an exact and it was a debate which which. Uh, uh, Put another uh, in another level, a debate in a broader debate in uh, in uh, Albania, and uh, in fact, um, in fact, this is uh, the situation. This is the, uh, a picture of the internment camp of uh, Tepelena, uh, but I would like you to to show also uh, a film, which is uh, made by students uh, with the support of the. Uh, uh, Switzerland Embassy. I don't know how to. Um, so it's a documentary film which is done by the students uh, about. Uh, it, the students realized some documentary films interviewing uh, people about uh, dealing with the past, and uh, it shows uh, the two. Uh, different uh, tendencies and to, uh, how the society in Albania is divided between people who are nostalgic of the period of communism and other people who uh, uh, suffered and who uh, were persecuted during So the first one, so the decline of knowledge about uh, uh, the communist dictatorship, uh, it can be attributed to the growth of a generation that does not have the memory of the communist regime. To close these gaps in knowledge, it is very necessary to intervene in school, um, in school education. Um, Although communist era history is part of the pre-university education curriculum, surveys show that most adolescents have little knowledge of it. The second trend of underestimation and glorification comes as a result of the radical uh, uh, changes brought about uh, by the change of the system. Uh, the transition process brought not only new freedoms and consumption uh, opportunities, but also social changes, such as high unemployment rates, rising prices, social inequality, feeling of negligence, which have provoked insecurity and disappointment. Two resolutions on the punishment on communism crimes, the law on the opening of ex-security files in 2015, the initiatives undertaken by various organizations and associations show a more active engagement with the past in different fields, but what we will see more closely in our presentation, remembrance through the cultural heritage institution. The National History Museum is the first institution of cultural heritage in the country that dealt with the theme of the communist past. The Pavilion of Communist Terror Victims was opened in 1996 and was renovated in 2009. In September 2014, in the former building of local branch of Ministry of Interior uh, offices uh, in Škodra was inaugurated the site of witness and memory in commemoration of the victims of dictatorship. Uh, Bunkart uh, 1 and 2 uh, in Tirana, the Cold War Tunnel in uh, Girocastra, um, the Memorial um, Rem of Remembrance in uh, Tirana, uh, titled Bos Postbloku, the initiatives for the creation of the Communist uh, uh, Terror Museum in Spach, which uh, Miriam will talk about later, and for the Memorial of the Internment Camp of Tepelena, uh, testify to a political and social will for preserving uh, the, um, um, the memorial places. Recently, um, the National Museum House of Leaves, uh, it added to the map of roads of remembrance as a memorial site of the communist dictatorship, in addition to other cultural and educational institutions with the mission, the commemoration of psychological uh, violence and control of citizens during the communist regime through the former state security, encouraging dialogue with and between citizens for the past, the present, and the Albanian future. The building known as the House of Leaves, so-called because of the clambering plant covering its facade, has transformed since 23rd of May 2017 
to the Museum of Secret Surveillance. Until 1991, the, this unobtrusive house in the middle of Tirana served as the headquarters of the Sigurimi, the secret service agency, operating throughout the long dictatorship of Enver Hoxha. Its location was crucial in the geopolitics of the city, for it had the normal appearance of a private villa, yet it was a sophisticated technical branch of government. The project of transforming the House of Leaves from a top secret place of surveillance, uh, whose code name in the Sigurimi documents was the Leaf, into the museum, was initiated by the Albanian Ministry of Culture in 2014 and supported by a multidisciplinary team of historians, associations of victims, institutions, engineers, and craftsmen from different countries. Um, the museum now, these are uh, pictures before the opening of the museum and some plans. Uh, um. The museum is divided into nine sectors with different numbers of rooms treating special themes. Uh, the materials exhibited in the corridor make often the logical linkage from one room to another. Uh, it's divided in prologue where it is, is the historical of, of the house, bags and other creatures with travel devices and uh, equipment which were used. Living microphones are the collaborators of uh, Sigurimi, the enemy, which is divided with internal enemies and external enemy, the everyday life, the voices of the past, panopticon and panacousticon, when I uh, would like to uh, state a bit more, it can be translated as the place where you can see and hear everything. This is, in fact, the philosophical idea of the museum, the one of the total control. Panopticon is the kind of prison architecture conceived by the utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham and his brother Samuel Bentham in the late 18th century. The purpose of the panoptic structure was to allow a guard placed in the central tower to observe all prisoners locked in individual cells around the, to the tower unnoticed by them. This gave to the prisoners a sense of being constantly observed but without knowing for sure. This architecture allows even the guards to be removed because only the feeling of being watched imposes a kind of conviction to the prisoners. Thus, being not too costly economically, the prison is first a blame enterprise that works with individual consciences through an overwhelming look. Albania during the dictatorship resembles to <coughs> panopticon of Jer Jeremy Bentham, where state security played the role of the central observation tower and like the panopticon prisoners, for the Albanian society, the perception of the tapping was stronger than the tapping it it itself, so the instinct of a permanent self-control was activated. So what, uh, what brings uh, new and which are the strong points? The National Museum of Secret Surveillance is an authentic memory site. It was and remains a labyrinth of rooms with all the traces of its transformation from a maternity clinic of 1931 to a top secret place of surveillance, it is full of breaks, scars, and unexpected places. The team immediately felt the urge to open every space to the public and to allow the house to speak. Nothing was removed, literally nothing, not even papers, drawings, nor of course hundreds of pieces of technical equipment. The power of authentic sites uh, and authentic objects offers a unique opportunity to better understand the past. The same powers have witnesses of the time. Um, names and uh, pictures uh, of the victims appear instead of symbol numbers. Both tools, lists of names and photos, aims to personalize uh, what otherwise would be an abstract number of those who died, disappeared, or were unjustly condemned. In cases where the victims were transfigured or where the body con cannot be found, this commemorative uh, practice seeks to regain the dead as a human being and symbolically undermine the dehumanization of the perpetrators. The core uh, of the exhibition is the spying tools. Hundreds of them are displayed on tables, revealing a surprising array of equipment for such a small, poor, and isolated country as Albania. Besides imported spy and surveillance equipment from Germany, Russia, Japan, and China, in the middle of the exhibits are the self-made Sigurimi bags. Rooms for wiretapping, 
telephones, a dark room for developing films and labs to test the presence of weaponized uh, biological and radioactive chemicals are opened to the public. But the museum uh, actually put more emphasis on the consequences of tapping than the curiosity of the tapping. The, in addition to the sophisticated equipment of the interception and exposure of collabor collaborators' files, the museum highlights the loss of life, imprisonment, deportation, social and professional degradation. The museum uses statistics, data, graphics, and texts on the walls, curtains, and many other areas to give a sound to the house, but at the same time, living people's voices heard, the stories of the victims to whom it's dedicated. The story in the museum is made from different perspectives. The views of the persecuted people of the communist regime are given through oral evidence. There are a lot of uh, oral history. In addition to numerous documentaries and interviews of political persecuted during the communist regime and their family members, which are realized by different institutions. For the first time in Albania, a museum itself uh, has realized and exhibited oral uh, testimony. On the other hand, the educational programs organized by the museum aim to rehabilitate prisoners and survivors as they are invited to speak systematically in museum, not only for their suffering in prisons and in internment camps, but also they speak for resistance, teach young people how to have a critical attitude to life. The point of view of uh, Sigurimi, which are exposed for the first time uh, in the files of Sigurimi. Uh, Albania approved a law on opening communist era secret files in May 2015 after more than two decades of transition to democracy and market economy, enabling the former persecuted people and their relatives to get to know the names of the people who spied on them. In the files and other documents in the Sigurimi view is the Sigurimi view, for example, the file of the victim of the communist uh, terror, uh, Edison Jergo, and the file of the agent. This is the, the file of the agent, for example, the uh, collaborator who gave information about a painter, Edison Jergo, uh, which was um, uh, condemned with eight years of prison in the, in the prison of Spachi, and one of the reasons was this, this painting that you can see there. Um, uh, in this way, the visitor can understand how um, the recruiting process of the collaborator collaborators functioned, how the collaborator himself was controlled also by the officer of Sigurimi, and how the totalitarian regime functioned. Um, the museum shows uh, in the exhibition the files of the collaborators of the secret surveil uh, surveillance during the communist regime in a country where the transitional justice has not occurred, where the persecuted people are still claiming their compensation and where none of the prosecutors have been condemned. Uh, there are displayed records of persecuted people from the communist regime, but also some testimonials of former employees of uh, Sigurimi. On the other side, museums uh, have historically uh, been designed with education in mind, and intentionally or not, museums give their views of what is worthwhile to learn. Uh, it's expressed uh, from the architecture to the summaries or wall texts, uh, through the panels, the labels, the statistics. Um, so uh, uh, is the point of view of the museum. Uh, and explicitly, it's given by some messages in the end of the exhibition. The past never dies. It's not even a past, a citation from William Faulkner. To the extent that the past can indeed be overcome, this can be achieved only by telling what happened of Hannah Arendt. And another citation of a persecuted uh, person who was also a writer, Amika Soruho. Perhaps I didn't think so at that moment, but later I thought that these people who did not apologize might have had an insolent courage. So the museum conveys the idea that the wounds of the communist past in Albania have not yet been healed and that the burial of the communist past brings neither healing nor justice for those who suffered. The past never dies because we carry its memory. The past is an inherent part of us. Every moment of our past builds what we are. So the past lives inside us. 
History is repeated and those who, who forgot the past are dest destined to repeat it. Request for forgiveness or recognition of committed crimes and taking responsibility has the potential to be a successful transitional justice mechanism. This is especially true when there is no prosecution of the main perpet perpetrators. Therefore, a request for forgiveness or at least acceptance of committed crimes would certainly make a difference, restoring the dignity of prisoners and political prisoners. Interactivity of the museum. Several rooms in the museum are bugged and the visitor is aware of it. When he arrives in room 27, he can also spy on other visitors who are visiting in that moment the bugged rooms. So the visitor can uh, also experience the process of wiretapping with the devices of Sigurimi. They can sit and take a breath in the living room where they are aware also that they are bugged too. Um, there are um, some public debates which uh, uh, accompanying the opening of the museum and which still continue and which are related to the difficult communist legacy. Um, some of the critics are why to transform this building in museum instead of the Spatch uh, prison. Uh, uh, it's a question of priorities. But it was more, uh, it was easy, easier to, uh, uh, to uh, to make this uh, museum, uh, Miriam with, will talk uh, later about Spatch prison and the difficulties to, to open it. Uh, the communist can't do a museum for persecuted people, for example, is another critic, because uh, the, uh, uh, the party which is in, in power and who did the museum is the Socialist Party and they make um, uh, equivalence of uh, Socialist Party with the communist, but uh, the, these were some critics which were done before the opening of the museum. Or you are glorifying the Sigurimi and the communist regime, which is not true because it's the story of the persecuted people uh, that is told in the museum. And also, why do you not uh, tell the real names? But uh, the problem is that we do not uh, settle accounts with the past. We clarify it by means of using the secret police records. And some names, uh, real names, are, are, are uh, hidden in, in the documents. Um, we, uh, the impact on visitor uh, numbers from uh, uh, 1st January 2018 to 13 November 2018, the museum has been visited by uh, 16,139 visitors, of whom uh, 9,667 foreigners and uh, 6,462 Albanians. Most of foreign visitors were from France and Italy, followed by England and United States. 2,736 students visited the museum, uh, 1,055 with t a ticket, and uh, uh, 1,681 uh, students visited the museum for the educational activities, which we do for, for free. Um, the dialogue with the younger generation, we think that is a very important, and after the visit, uh, the, the, there are some activities where the uh, uh, young uh, people can, after the visit, they can uh, do uh, a meeting with, uh, with uh, persecuted people and uh, we did a training for the persecuted, uh, some, about, for, there were 14 persecuted people who did a training to, uh, thanks also to the OSCE, uh, just to be guides in the, in the museum. And uh, this is another uh, some activities that uh, we do with uh, persecuted people who come and talk. And another, uh, another activity that uh, we do, it's, it's, uh, it's called impressions. Uh, and uh, children are children and young people, they are invited to, to express their uh, uh, impressions after, after the visit in the museum. And uh, after that, we have done an exhibition with their works and we published their, their works. Uh, a temporary exhibition that we opened, Albania's Road of Communism, and uh, uh, another thing, uh, trying to be uh, more inclusive, uh, we have ameliorated the web page and we have done it accessible for uh, blind people and uh, we have realized also some guides in uh, Braille thanks to the cooperation with Balkan Museum Network and Balkan Museum Access, uh, Access Group. Uh, 
conclusions and future perspectives, the museum tries to put the basis of a good relationships and uh, interaction in the society, highlighting the trauma of the victims and the responsibility of the perpetrators and beneficiaries. Reconciliation with such a past can only be achieved not simply through grief, but also through discussion and dialogue. Different views over the past should be respected, provided that they do not advocate committing crimes. Our vision is that the museum become a platform for the dialogue to help define the past of Albania and the discovery of truth uh, during the communist regime. And I believe that we need to begin the process of healing the pain of the past by discovering the truths. Our focus will be the young generation, explaining the differences between democracy and dictatorship and sensitizing young generation is, in the respect is uh, one of the major challenges to the museum and other institutions in the process of revisiting the past. We believe that the better we understand dictatorship, the better we can shape democracy. Um, this is also a, a video, but I don't know if it will. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. Şimdi, evet, Etbeva, thank you. Um, şimdi sırada. Next we have Miriam. Uh, cultural Heritage Without Borders, the Albanian manager. He is going to talk to us about the transformation of Spach prison into a museum. It goes without saying that we are all very pleased to be here in Istanbul. And thanks again to the Hranding Foundation and the lovely staff for having us, treating us really, really well. We feel at home. And I would like also to thank the audience for defying the cold, the rain, mm -hmm. the humidity perhaps, and being with us here. We know that it has been a long day for you and probably there is a temptation as well to go home and sitting comfortably in a warm room in, in your preferred sofa. Um, and like the three previous presentations, I don't have a museum yet to talk about. But I have, um, I, I would like to share with you um, some elements of our um, work with the site of the prison of Spats that has been mentioned. And when we talk about Spach, I invite you to bear in mind that there are specific places on Earth and specific people as well that uh, um, have a potential to, uh, to really change people, a potential to, to really foster understanding and also a potential for really making people feel empowered and enabled to take action, to take responsibility for themselves, of course, but even for the world around them. Um, before I start getting into more details, I would like to tell you a short story about Albania. Atleva did show you some background, but I would like to take a, a moment to kind of, I mean, depict the, the, the situation of Albania, especially in the 90s, 80s decades, so it was nearly 40 years ago. It was a, perhaps one of the most uh, difficult decades because um, there was no food for everyone, their food and, in general, uh, goods were, were scarce, so it was really difficult to get things like books, clothes, and stuff like that. In the same time, it was, so it was the most difficult time, time perhaps, but it was also the time when propaganda was at, at its paroxysm. And propaganda wasn't sparing anyone, it was even in the primary schools. And the story I'm, I'm about to tell is about a teacher that is doing propaganda with young pupils. We are in a classroom in the 80s in Albania and the teacher is asking to the pupils in which country in the world kids are the happiest kids? And the kids would chant all together, in Albania, in Albania. <laughs> and the teacher to continue, in which country in the world kids have the best books? And again the kids to chant, in Albania, in Albania. Mm -hmm. Very enthusiastic and very convinced of their answers. And the teacher to continue, in which country in the world kids have the best clothes? And again, kids in a chorus, in Albania, in Albania. All of a sudden, someone bursts into tears. There is a complete silence now in the classroom. You can hear the footsteps of the teacher approaching towards the back of the classroom. The teacher stops at Benny's desk. Benny is a little guy that is crying. And the teacher asks, Benny, 
Why are you crying? And the poor Benito replied while drying his tears. He says, teacher, I would like to go to Albania. <laughs> so, propaganda, I said, which is, I think, a key element also in this kind of dictatorial systems, and it's, a, it's an integ integral element of, uh, I think, persecution. Because it doesn't just designate culprits or scapegoats, but it also creates a very difficult climate, a climate that is not favorable at all and understanding what is really going on, or a climate that it's not, does not push people actually to have that kind of interest, you know, to, to really think hardly about what is happening around them. And I think this is one of the long-term consequences that we are suffering, suffering from the regime because still nowadays, three decades after the change of the, 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 the regime, there are people that are not interested at all in knowing more about that past. And actually it's 50% of our, of, our, of our society according to a survey in 2016. So 50% of people that do not know, do not want to know more about communism and our active involvement in creating such a system and in maintaining such a system for such a long time, four decades, actually. And um, when you consider as well that 50% of Albanians are under the age of 30 years old, then you are really worried about what is going to happen in the next decades, you know? And then um, I think there is a very simple answer to why especially young people, as Atleva mentioned, have no interest in knowing more about communism. I think they are caught in a situation where they are shaped from competing stories. On one hand, you have the stories of families that, have, um, um, that are in complete denial of the violence perpetrated during communism, perhaps because they were complicit in it. On the other hand, you have the families who suffered from this violence and that continue to pass on the wounds from that violence. And there is a third group, actually, of people that are the people that just simply ignore that there was persecution during that time and just simply ignore that there were places like Spach, prisons like Spach in Albania. Um, I think this younger generation that is growing in Albania um, has inherited a kind of fragmented and distorted past which um, remains essentially unknowable nowadays. Unknowable, that's the, the right word and unknowable because it still shapes as well their opinions nowadays, today as we speak, their beliefs, their thoughts, their actions. And I was myself one of these persons actually that uh, tended to ignore the complexity of our recent history. I, te I tended to be like that until I met this man that you see on the screen now. Uh, his name is Zenel Drangu, a former prisoner in Spach, that uh, uh, served 16 years there. You know why Zanel was convicted? He was convicted because he tried to leave Albania. Actually, he swam his way to the freedom in ex-Yugoslavia at that time. So he, he, so he swam a distance like um, maybe from Ortakoy to Kadikoy on, on the other side. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm speculating. Sorry if I do that. <laughs> but he swam to the lake of Skodra, to the other side of the border, which was ex-Yugoslavia. His freedom lasted only three days. He was caught. He was sent back to, to Albania. And for the next 16 years of his life, he worked as a slave in uh, the mines of Spach, extracting copper and pirate from the mines. Because this is what Spach is about. It's a... Uh, it's a kind of gulag, Stalinist gulag model, implemented right in the heart of Europe. Albania is, let's say, in the middle of the geographical, let's say, understanding of Europe. And it was a mining uh, uh, exploitation from the state that needed more free labor to, to carry on its work. And, um, sorry for the inconvenience. I'm getting really, yeah, no, emotional about this. <laughs> Um, it, the, as the mine needed more and more free forced labor, free uh, working forces, the state decided to, to, to put a prison there. Why not? We have all these prisoners hanging around. They do nothing anyway, so why, put them, why not put them in, in the mines? And this is how, at first, uh, 600 prisoners were established in Spach. They had to build their own cells, which is a very interesting concept as well. And 
as the prison continued to work, more and more political opponents were put in that prison because it was judged that that was the harshest prison of Albania. So, and that the worst enemies of the state needed, deserved to be in that prison. Um, Spot is also very important because in 1973, uh, it was the scene of one of the only revolts against communism in Albania. And for three days, in May 73, uh, prisoners seized control and um, they were demanding very, very simple stuff. Uh, they were not demanding to be, to be liberated, to be freed, but they were demanding better working conditions and a fair treatment for, for the fellow Albanians that were outside the prison. Can you imagine how noble is that? You are imprisoned and you are not asking for your own liberation, but you are asking, thinking about the, the, the fate of the other people that are outside the prison. Yeah, um, it worked until 1992, so it, has a, it had a very short life. Spatch was never built anyway to, uh, to last long. It was very simple materials that they could, could find locally, and they could be built, like I said, with the help of the, 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 the inmates, help of the inmates as well. Um, it was closed in 1992, and since then, um, the site, in this on site, we can only find eight remaining buildings from a total of 25, 24, 26 buildings that were initially there. Um, what happened from 92 to nowadays is that the site, of course, went on a process of natural decay because of uh, uh, climate conditions. Um, it also um, suffered from looting because the prison sits in one of the poorest areas of Albania and whatever the people living nearby the prison could get from the prison, objects, furniture, things that they could sell, they, they already took. They even took metals or wires that were inside the walls that could be reached easily in order to, to be sold for scrap. So we are talking about a, a survival strategy uh, from the people uh, living around Spatch. Um, what happened to the mines? The mines that were exploited by the prisoners, uh, they were abandoned as well. And it appears that in this line of work, the mines that are not used for, for a long time, they tend to collapse on themselves. So they are practically closed in, and inexploitable again today. By doing so, they, they have buried so many memories, so many accounting, so many events that happened in those galleries, which is a shame. And unfortunately, we might have lost most of those stories. Um, <coughs> so to sum up, we are, um, we are dealing with, um, with a, let's say, a potential museum, but which doesn't have any objects preserved, conserved. We are dealing about, with people, survivors like Zanel that I told you that are, are, are today there, but who knows how long they will be able to live. We are dealing also with, um, with a mine that is now being exploited by a private company, you know, making profit, etc. And we are also dealing with this general context of indifference or lack of interest to have this kind of, um, let's say, um, endeavors going on in Albania. So it's a very difficult context to work with. But it's difficult, but not impossible. And we try to tackle this problem by um, uh, creating first um, a platform based on dialogue. The four of us have mentioned dialogue on and on and on and on and on. But I, I believe there are many, many significations we people grant to dialogue, but in this case, dialogue is a process that consists in inviting people who tend to have opposite view or different opinions to engage in a discussion, in an open-ended, let's say, a discussion. And the idea of the dialogue is not for everyone to agree at the end of the, the, that process, but the idea is for everyone to be able to acknowledge that there are several ways of experiencing, several ways of understanding the same thing or the same historical period and so on and on and on. And the, the beauty about dialogue is that at the end of the dialogue, then everyone respects each other's opinions and then have this kind of feeling that, you know, okay, we achieved something together um, through, through, through the dialogue. Um, in, in practice, we used this facilitated dialogue technique as, um, let's say, provided by the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, which is, I, I really suggest those of you that are interested in, in, in these techniques to check this uh, um, international uh, organization. Um, we used these techniques to, to, to build a series of workshops with the main stakeholders of SPATCH. Workshops that consisted in, first of all, doing a, a kind of um, diagnosis together um, with the main stakeholders, um, sharing views and, and opinions about what the future of the site could be, 
And thirdly, uh, to agree on a, on a joint plan, on a, a common initiatives among these different types of stakeholders to, in order to move, move forward and not to leave the site you know, abandoned as, as, as it used to be until very recently. So we concluded this, this first series of workshops with a, a, a very serious action plan, very concrete, and uh, you know, the added value of that was that it was agreed by people that at first couldn't sit at the same table. So that, that, that was really something very, very powerful. As part of this action plan, then different stakeholders starting to implement the different steps that were suggested. We, our organization, Cultural Heritage Without Borders, we were the first ones to invest in the in emergency consolidation interventions, as we call them in our jargon, um, interventions that were aimed at making sure that those eight buildings that remain today are not further disappearing or further decaying. Um, of course, it's not enough. There were other, uh, other kind, kind of works, either insulation, and basically everything that, that deals a bit with uh, you know, stopping the, the, the process of deterioration. Um, and this to make sure that the sites live for the next 10, 15 years, but of course more substantial interventions are needed. So we, we work with stakeholders, we, we work with the physical condition of the site, but also we decided to work with what we think will be the key audiences of the future for this site that isn't there yet in a way. And um, it's very interesting, again, to state that our main focus were the young ones, since many of those that are born after the 90s, and as Atleva Nalbani said, uh, Demolari said, those ones are the ones that tend to think that this is science fiction, that this kind of prisons or tortures or persecution never happened. So they just do not believe in, in, in the, the, the reality of these facts. So it's particularly important to work with them. But also, as we mentioned, we worked with history teachers um, because they have the same problem. Most of the history teachers in Albania are now from a young, younger generation. They don't have direct experience of the life under communism regime or they, very, they have very few access points to uh, survivors or persecuted families, etc. So they don't feel comfortable in teaching something that they, they do not feel there, let's say, or they don't, do not understand. But of course, with museum professionals, just to build upon the different experiences that, that are now in Albania, human rights activism, activists, in a way, to connect struggles of the past with today's you know, uh, difficulties of the societies. And of course, tours of tour operators and tourists, because now there is a trend in Albania for tourists, foreign, foreign tourists to come. And because Albania has still this identity of a, commun a communist country, many tourists come from, for that reason, actually, so to be able to locate some of these, let's say, uh, communist aspects of, um, of Albania. Um, the way focus groups were organized, should you be interested in that? It's very simple. It's um, uh, visits that were guided by survivors, people like Zanel, or fellow uh, prisoners, former prisoners. Um, that those visits were preceded and then followed by s different sets of questionnaires that allowed us to kind of, not measure, but really assess the impact of such visits. And then a more serious discussion, reflective, reflexive oriented discussion happened with the, with the members of the group, actually after, after this visit. And we can say that it was very fruitful for us because combining our own knowledge and the, the experiences that we got from the process of making an action plan together with stakeholders and then with the inputs of the key future audiences, we managed to create um, what we call the, the concept for SPACH, which is a document that serves us as a, as a guiding, let's say, guideline for what we should do next with SPACH. And I will summarize that document in, in, in three simple steps. The first one, and it's a it's a it's a urgency, let's say, is to keep visits going on in Spatch. As you saw, it's not a site that it's properly a site because it doesn't provide the visitors with the with the most minimal, let's say, conditions for visiting, starting from the safety of the itinerary. And so we would like to work immediately with, with this as aspect in the in following months. But also, by doing that, we would like to work a bit more with orientation on site and, um, if I may say, high quality interpretation, because interpretation is what can bring that site alive together with the, the inputs, of course, of survivors. And also, we want to equip the, the site with a multifunctional visitor center as to be able to um, provide a safe place, a safe space for difficult discussions that might follow the, the visit in such a site. Um, the second aspect that I wanted to highlight from the concept is 
Of course, we have the survivors now. So how to fully use their experience and their expertise, I insist on the, on the word expertise, um, to make sure that the site is, uh, the future museum, if I may say, is conceived in the right way, is planned in the right way, and will be implemented in the right way. And the first way to do that is, of course, to, to build uh, what we call the Voices of Spatch visitor experience. Um, to, to build this visitor experience together with the inputs from the survivors. Of course, always cross-matching individual, let's say, stories and experiences with historical facts, uh, ar archival material, and, you know, to have a kind of uh, understanding uh, of what is really said and told to people that will be visiting. And, yeah. of course, um, of course, play with uh, the, the digital, let's say, opportunities that now, I mean, our age provides, but also provide as much as we can opportunities for interactive learning and education uh, on sites, things like find the writing on the wall or find the hidden treasure, you know, just to make sure that also teenagers and young, the young adults are interested in while visiting this type of sites. Um, also, the feedback and the integration of survivors in, in, the, in the concept is very important when it comes to defining the conservation approach or what kind of intervention to do with the site. Restore completely, restore partially, um, reconstruct, which always in our line of work is, a, is an extreme measure. But one of the learnings we had from the focus groups organized with these different, uh, let's say, key audiences, they all combined together in one very specific moment, which is to reconstruct some of the features that belong to the prison that are not there anymore. I'm talking about things like uh, the barbed wire system that we use to surround the site, the watchtowers, simple, other simple things like bars in the windows or entrance gates to the, to the prisons and so on. And we would like to do that as well, and of course, based on to again, again, the input from the survivors and accurate historical material. The third aspect of the concept is um, to have a site that is able to, to work on the long run, and not just for three, four, five years. And in order to do that, there are two key moments. The first one, <coughs> I'm sorry, the first one being um, to provide a clear framework of, um, of uh, responsibilities, because as we stand now, the site belongs to uh, the, 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 let's say, partially to the mining company that I mentioned earlier, partially to the state and partially to the Ministry of Culture, and no one has a clear responsibility on what needs to be done and who is accountable for what and so on. So that we should clarify that, and this takes a bit, by experience in Albina, this always takes a bit of time to, you know, to, to happen. The second most important thing is to, for the site to start as well generating its own incomes, and for that we would like to explore some new ideas in the sense that we would like to use uh, stories and experiences from the site to build events that are carefully curated and designed to, of course, respect the, the, the history of the site, respect the memories of the people that were there, but also to kind of showcase and portray how people resisted in, 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 in such a horrible, let's say, environment, how people managed to survive, to keep themselves motivated and encouraged to, you know, to, to go on and to, to, to move on and to hope for better days. There, there were several interesting things happening in Spatch from the point of view of arts and culture. One of these being uh, a very interesting concert happening in the horizon number four of the mines in, the, in, the, in Spatch. We are talking about a place that is buried 50, 60 meters uh, down in, in, the, in one of the, uh, um, beneath the ground, if I may say. So it's the New Year's Eve in 74. And after finishing the, the third shift, uh, I mean, during the, the third, third shift, prisoners start to organize an uh, impromptu concert, having there a, a former tenor who, which, who was singing La Traviata, um, another uh, important uh, Albanian singer, Sharif Merdani, who was um, singing pop songs, and then another one who was singing um, traditional uh, music as well. But they didn't have instruments, they didn't have lights. All they would do is just sing by their voice and then <laughs> clap the hands. So this is the way how they celebrated the, the, the in the new year at that time. And this is a nice occasion, we think, to, 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 to reinterpret and then to bring again um, um, 
a live, if I may say, in the form of a festival or, or a thematic days that we have decided to, to we have decided, we would like to call it the Paresia uh, days or festival. Paresia coming from the word, the Greek word Paresiastes, which means um, um, to, to bear the duty to say the truth and to know that because of saying the truth, you would end up in a, in a, in a bad spot, if I may say, which is something that um, many of these people that were in Spach, I mean, they, 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 they suffered. So, <coughs> and again, the, the, there are also other ideas for involving arts as a way of uh, expressing difficult, uh, let's say, or uh, as a way to facilitate difficult discussions, but currently the environment in Albania suggests that uh, people tend to be a bit reluctant when it comes to, 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 to you know, forms of uh, integrating art and, and memory places together. I don't know what happened to this one, but uh, another, way, another way of keeping the site, let's say, uh, uh, meaningful and alive and to propose different uh, uh, activities during the year is also to organize uh, a su an international summer school based on the... Based on... Can you hear me now? Yeah? Based on uh, uh, memory and, and human rights activism. And also uh, to find a way to generate local smaller local fluxes of economy for local people, which I mentioned earlier, are really, really poor. So that would make sites, the site relevant and meaningful even from that point of view for the local people. Um, even if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Um, just to, to summarize what I've said, um, the, the, the meaning of our work and the, 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 the potential for this site is to to, uh, to be able to work with people, visitors, on three different levels. So increasing their knowledge about the site and, of course, about how mechanisms of uh, persecution and perpetration used to happen in the past but are bound to happen, are happening in the, in the present and are bound to happen in the future because human nature is in, 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 the, the, in that way. So no one is immune from that. Uh, on a second level, to foster empathy, and I believe my colleagues already, already talked a lot about best examples actually on how to do that and thirdly is to encourage really visitors to take to take action and to you know to feel that they have a direct say and a direct go actually in what happens in their close environment and what happens in the world around them and of course as we say here it does not have to be considered as a choice or something that you can do but it has to be you that does that something in order to save the world if i may say Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all, <laughs> one by one. Teşekkür ediyoruz herkese.